What's cracking? Big dogs. Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDG. Big dogs gotta eat. And we're just gonna keep throwing out fucking zingers. Videos have been ripping. They've been doing numbers. Y'all have been supporting, and I love you for that. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe. We're doing everything fantasy football for the entirety of the summer, getting you prepped for your draft. Today, we're gonna keep. Uh, we're keep we keep rolling with running backs. We talked about some of my must-own running backs. We talked about some running backs that are going in the middle rounds, early rounds, some of them that you should avoid. If you've missed any of these videos, they will be linked in the description. Today, we're going to be talking about some later round running backs. Sometimes you get a little excited earlier on in drafts and you say, ooh, Travis Kelsey's falling to the 2-5 or Devontae Adams is still sitting there at the 2-2. I like Tyreek Hill. I like Tyreek Hill. I'm going to drive him to the 110. So you, you, so you do something fucking stupid and you take these wide receivers, these pass catchers early, thus foregoing the running back position. And then you're sitting there 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th round. And guess what? You need to shore up that RB2 hole, that RB3 hole, that RB4 hole. Running backs matter and they're the only things that matter. So we're going to keep putting out running back videos. Today, we are talking about five guys Five guys that you need to be drafting higher. Five running back sleepers. Five must-own late-round running backs, however you want to put it. YouTube, pick up my words and throw it into the SEO hole and bring the views my way, baby. So we're talking about five running backs that I love going later on in fantasy football drafts per underdog ADP. If you're not yet drafting on underdog, I don't know what the fuck is you doing. They are available in Pennsylvania. They just went live in Pennsylvania a few days ago. Okay, so if you've been waiting to draft with me or with the other big dogs, make sure you go to... Make sure you go to underdogfantasy.com. We're all excited. I'm excited. The reserved sign got knocked off the table because guess what? Pennsylvania is no longer reserved. It is open. Underdog Fantasy, the app will be right down below. You're getting $25 free when you deposit on there if you use the promo code BDGE. Are we ready to roll? Because I'm ready to fucking roll, which means we got to tuck our shirts in. Stop yelling. Let's eat. So typically, I would have started this list off with Damian Harris, but I used him in the must-own running back video. His ADP at the time was around 88. I won't be disrespectful and waste your times. And since that video, he's moved up to around 83, 82. The big dogs got a little push in that ADP data. So we're not going to go with Damian Harris here. Instead, we're going to rip. This is this is going to be the, the energy in this video is going to be a, a little a little hectic right now. Because it's basically every running back that I absolutely hated last year, okay? Every running back that I told you guys to avoid in the early to middle rounds, the old dudes that we knew were on their way out. We ha we hated the vet. All the homies hated the veterans last year. The Mark Ingrams, the Le'Veon Bells, the Todd Gurleys. And we were like, yeah, those dudes are like one snap knee away from never doing physical activity again in their life. And guess what happened? That shit happened. There are a few dudes, a few dudes that we didn't like last year that came away unscathed. They're veterans, they're savvy, and now they're going like seven rounds later than they were last year. And this is when we pile on the value. So the first, the first running back on this list that you guys are not drafting high enough right now, it's Uncle Lenny. Uncle Lenny out in Tampa Bay. Currently the running back 34, 93rd pick overall. And listen, nobody shit on Uncle Lenny more than I did last year. Walmart did not run out of toilet paper because the pandemic happened. Walmart ran out of toilet paper because I stayed shitting on Uncle Lenny. But it's a new year. It's a new draft. It's a new smash. And we are smashing the draft button on Leonard Fournette in the ninth, 10th round. Simply what it comes down to is you want a piece of this Tampa Bay backfield. And to be honest with you, man, I'm not I'm not against taking Ronald Jones either. I'm not against taking both of them in redraft. I'm not against taking Leonard Fournette in one draft and the next draft you take Ronald Jones around later. But case in point is this. As fantasy players, we are, un because of the volatility that we saw last year, we are underestimating just how valuable this backfield is going to be in fantasy football in 2021. Like, yes, Brady is a monster coming off a monster year. This offense is going to be a finely tuned machine, but the passing part of it is the shiny toy, which doesn't let you see the foundation of what this offense is going to be built on. Okay. That might've been like the biggest reach of all time. This offense is not going to be built on the running game, but the shininess of the passing game is what's going to set up the run game. There's going to be a lot to go around for everybody to eat. This is a family reunion. And guess who is attending with a seat at the table? 
Uncle Lenny. This offense averaged over 30 points per game last year, which was the second highest pace in the NFL. And on top of that, this passing game is just not going to, to need a lot of volume because they're going to be so efficient. They're going to be in the red zone consistently. And this defense, man, more importantly, this defense is going to be smothering. So it's going to be a play elite defense, get the ball on offense, move efficiently, ground and pound, run out the clock, stomp on teams. They're going to absolutely destroy the Falcons. They're going to destroy the Saints. They're going to destroy the Panthers. There's six games right off the rip in which they're going to outscore the opponents by 21 and need to run the ball and run the ball and run the ball and run the ball and run the ball. Brady had his highest touchdown rate, right? Percentage of his throws that went for touchdowns since 2010. That number is going to come down a little bit. Fournette scored on one of nine goal line carries last year. That number is going to come up a little bit. And you just look at how things started in Tampa Bay last year. Things were weird, right? It was new faces, new players, new places, injuries, depth chart switching, Antonio Brown coming in. It was just people in and out of the lineup. But when it mattered, when it mattered, like in real life, your mother's brother showed up. Uncle Lenny rushed 64 times for 300 yards in the Bucks four playoff games and he played on the third downs he was the third down back he took control of that backfield when you look at ronald jones he made three appearances and in those three appearances in the postseason 35 carries for 139 yards when you look at what lenny did it was no no contest fournette scored seven times in his final seven games of last year and as much as we needed to clench our ass cheeks every time brady dumped off to a running back the volume was still there fournette had 47 targets in 13 games you pace that out to 16 games you're looking at a 60 target year and the drops yes it was it was ugly but I believe that to be uncharacteristic of him dating back to his time at LSU. He was a pass catcher dating back to his time in Jacksonville. He was a good pass catcher, maybe not efficient, but he caught the damn ball. At the end of the day, Fournette is just a true, a true standalone value running back with really, really, really high upside if something were to happen to Rojo, just given the offense and the success that this offense is going to have. And like I said, vice versa, man, I don't dislike Rojo either. And at this point, I mean, I, I was pretty high on Rojo last year and he's proven to be way better than most people wrote him off as after like a bad 20 year old rookie you're the youngest running back coming out of that class. And uh, Rojo's become like a very good player, but it's clear that he's not getting the work in the passing game. And it's clear that when it mattered down the stretch last year, it was Leonard Fournette. They're going in with a completely fresh year, a new summer to implement the offense. Yes, they added Gio Bernard, but at this point, that was probably just a depth piece. They hate Keyshawn Vaughn. Bruce Harrings hates Keyshawn Vaughn, but he didn't play at all his rookie year. He's already getting bad reports out of for missing uh, voluntary OTAs or whatever the fuck it was, because he's got no leverage. He, he, what did he think? What does he think? He's the fucking Brady of running backs where he could just show up when he wants to and get play time. Not thy case. Okay. So Leonard Fournette, Love him in the ninth round right now. The upside there is very, 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 very real. So we could shift from one fat running back to another where I, I'd say that the upside is probably not as real. The upside is, is is very, very, very fake. But in somewhat similar situations, we have Zach Moss, Buffalo Bills, current ADP running back 36, 98th pick overall. And to be honest with you, the Buffalo situation is sort of like a poor man's uh, Ronald Jones and Leonard Fournette situation, just happening to be in Buffalo. And despite the despite all the links and the reports and the rumors of Buffalo being tied to every free agent running back out there, and maybe them taking a running back at the end of the first round, whatever, all they did was bring in Matt Breda. And Matt Breda might as well have no ankles at this point. So what I mean by them being in similar situations is you look at Tampa Bay, you look at Buffalo, they both have really, really good offenses and project to have really high scoring offenses again in 2021, right? Tampa Bay was second in scoring. Buffalo was right behind them, third in scoring, 29.9 points per game. Someone on this team is going to score 10 rushing touchdowns. I know. Pause. It's Josh Allen. Ha 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 ha. He'll probably rise. Fuck you. Regardless, Singletary stinks, man. Like he really stinks. He's just an undersized version of Zach Moss at this point. And his splits when Moss was out of the game versus when he was actually in the game are disgusting. They're ugly, right? He He's not involved in the passing game. He's barely involved on the ground, right? His rushing attempts go from 14 down to 8.7. Targets go from 4 to 3. Receptions 3.3 to 2.1. Singletary was barely, barely involved, man. When Moss, remember Moss started off the year with this ankle injury and he missed some time. He missed a couple games in the beginning of the year and it took him a while to get back into the, the swing of things with the offense. Um, and Singletary just like didn't play a role once Zach Moss was getting touches and getting carries. And in the games where Moss was healthy, he out- carried Singletary 11 to three on the goal line. So that's his role down there. Despite, you know, Josh Allen getting a lot of the work there, 11, 11 goal line carries is not something to bat an eye out, especially when you miss three games. What else I found interesting, maybe, maybe not interesting, maybe, maybe a little bit surprising, maybe a little bit interesting was Zach Moss 
actually, like as a pure runner, was not bad last year, right? I'm not going to lie. This this kind of shocked me. Coming out of college, we knew he was like this elusive back. One of those guys who's like elusive rating gets everybody a PFF's dick hard, but it rarely actually translate into the NFL. You look at the metrics on player profiler and Zach Moss had a juke rate 29.4%, which was seventh in the NFL. His yards created per touch also seventh in the NFL. If you look at both of those metrics, they are basically telling you how good a running back was on their own, you know, isolated outside of the offensive line, just what they're doing when a, a, a tackler or defender is in their way. And Zach Moss was very, very good. And uh, you look at his avoided tackles per attempt uh, per PFF. He was 14th in the league last year, which was tied with running backs named Austin Eckler, Aaron Jones, Chris Carson, Josh Jacobs, CEH, like pretty damn good company. So I'm not saying Moss will get all the goal line carries here because Allen will get a bunch of them. Um, but Moss was 16th in the league again, and that was uh, 16th in the league in goal line carries, and that was with three missed games. So with a with an improved Buffalo offense, with a fucking high-paced, high-efficiency, high-scoring offense in Buffalo again this year, there's no reason that if he plays the full 16 games, he can't be top 10 or top 6, 8, whatever, in goal line carries this year. And if that's the case, man, he could kind of wiggle his way into, you know, 8 to 10 rushing touchdowns. And by that point, like you're getting that in the 10th, 11th, 12th round, He's he's going to he's going to be like a low end RB two or a high end RB three and I'll take that fucking return all day. Same with Gus Edwards, man. He's kind of in a similar a similar role as Zach Moss out in Baltimore, and he's another guy that I know has become a popular pick for uh, late round running backs and guys that you should be stocking up in best ball. He's one of my most owned, highest exposure players in best ball right now at the running back position. That's one of my favorite parts of underdog fantasy. If you do a bunch of drafts, I actually show you your exposure to the players that you're picking. So when I'm looking at running backs. Uh, it was from 2020. I was looking at it like, why the fuck do I have so much Anthony McFarland? I have a lot of exposure to J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards, Damian Harris, Tony Pollard, Derrick Henry. What a pick by me. But yeah, man, when it comes down to it, Gus Edwards is just a good football player. He's been such a good role player for the Ravens for the three years that he's been in the NFL. And I found a pretty crazy stat today as I was I was diving deep. As I used to say on this channel, we're bringing out the big facts only. Okay, Gus Edwards. Going back to the year 2000, there have only been three running backs that have started out their career in their rookie and sophomore year that saw at least 130 carries and averaged 5.0 yards per carry or more as both a rookie and a sophomore. That list is comprised of Clinton Portis, Nick Chubb, and Gus Edwards. If you extend that to the third year, so you have three straight years, you start off your career with at least 130 carries, at least 5.0 yards per carry, that's just bust down Gus and Nick Chubb. Only two players over the last 20, 21 years that have gone the first three seasons with those numbers. Uh, Jonathan Taylor and J.K. Dobbins, his teammate, can join that small list if they both go over five yards per carry and 130 carries this year. I mean, at the end of the day, listen, like Dobbins is the explosive guy. Gus has a very cap ceiling uh, because we don't know what the goal line work is going to look like. I believe him and Dobbins are probably going to split that. Lamar Jackson's obviously a threat on the goal line. I did find it crazy that Lamar Jackson only had three carries inside the five-yard line last year, so that number will probably come up a little bit. But with a little bit of touchdown luck this year for Gus Edwards, I mean, that could go a long fucking way. And now we're going into the year with Mark Ingram completely out of the picture. It's we're not. I don't think it's unlikely to see Gus Ed Edwards finish with like seven and nine rushing touchdowns this year. We look at Gus Edwards over the last two seasons, a tweet from my boy Pfeiffer, over at Fade the Noise, yards before contact per attempt, yards after contact per attempt, yards per carry. So overall efficiency for Gus Edwards has been off the fucking charts, right? And this is obviously the most run-heavy team in the NFL. So Gus is going to get a lot of opportunity. He's averaged nearly double-digit touches in the three years that he's been in the NFL. And double-digit touches isn't necessarily something to go crazy about, right? Especially double-digit touches that, one, aren't receptions, and two, probably aren't like explosive plays. Or I guess like, I shouldn't say explosive plays, but like Hail Mary home run type plays, right? If, if you're a 10 touch per game guy, but you can hit the 50 or 60 yard play that's big Gus Edwards is not going to do that but Gus Edwards I think is probably a better athlete than most people actually realize like his his weight adjusted speed score like how fast he is for his size is in the 80th percentile so while that came as a little bit of a surprise to me this did not right true yards per carry yards per touch breakaway runs breakaway run rate okay so breakaway runs are runs of 15 plus yards and I make this point a lot like these are these are where guys like Josh Jacobs and those intermediary runners this is where like a Trey Sermon is going to excel where he's not going to hit the home run he's not going to give you 40 yard runs 60 yard runs but he will give you seven yard runs nine yard runs 13 yard runs continuously because they've got the good burst they've got the good acceleration they're not going to break away from the defense but the vision to move in and out of the line and then burst through for seven to 10 yards adds up. When you get double digit touches, that ends up being, you know, 50, 70, 90 yards. And when you score every other game, you end up being a low end fantasy RB2, high end RB3.
And the Ravens team is just very good, man. The Ravens team is just going to be very good. They're going to blow some teams out in 2021. Uh, his game script is going to be juicy. When they're blowing teams out, like they're going to want to use, you know, their backup running back in Gus Edwards, even though I think him and Dobbins are probably going to split snaps like pretty evenly this year. Uh, they start off with Kansas City or Las Vegas, Kansas City, Detroit, like three terrible run defenses. And then their fantasy playoffs, weeks 14, 15, 16, Cleveland, Green Bay, Cincinnati. So really, really juicy there. I love Gus, Gus Edwards right now, currently going off the board, uh, running back 40. 115 overall as the pick. And I want to get into some honorable mentions and y'all can waste your time in the fucking comment section about handcuffs where your literal only analysis is like, if the guy above him gets hurt, then he's going to be a good player. Like, you know, Tony Pollard saves that shit for the birds. I'm firmly, firmly on the stance in redraft of drafting your own handcuffs as opposed to drafting other people's handcuffs. I don't know why that has become the, the, the popular thing over the last few years, but if you've ever drafted a workhorse running back and then didn't have the handcuff because you thought it was cool to shoot for upside in redraft, like, listen, floor works in redraft because you just need to get into the fucking playoffs, okay? So that's a wildly unpopular take somehow, and I love to see it. So your handcuffs, get your handcuffs, whatever you want to do there. James Conner, I think he's more than a handcuff in Arizona this year, man. So he's one of my honorable mentions. Current ADP, running back 38, 104 overall. I've talked a lot about Chase Edmonds already this offseason, how I just don't think he is a good draft pick in the middle rounds, fifth, sixth, seventh round. We start to flirt with, you know, maybe where I'm looking to take a guy like Chase Edmonds. But here's the thing. Cliff Kingsbury, over the last three years, since since Chase Edmonds has come into the league, has shown us clearly that he does not trust Chase Edmonds with a big workload on the ground. The guy had a, a, a career-high 95 carries last year, Chase Edmonds did. And that was with Kenyon Drake having a high ankle sprain and one of those games by Chase Edmonds having 25 carries in it. So his career high, 95, still hasn't hit 100 carries in a season and 25 of them came in one game, okay? Kenyon Drake saw 21 goal line carries last year. Chase Edmonds saw one. Listen, Kyler's not a big check down guy to, to his running backs. And now you add Rondell Moore and now you add AJ Green to the pass catching mix. And I'd rather have the guy who's going to get goal line carries and carries between the 20s than the pass catching guy in this offense. Okay. So give me, give me James Conner over Chase Edmonds four rounds later. I don't think James Conner is anything special at this point, but there's a price for everyone. And this is the right one for him. Next up on the honorable mention list. Ah, man, this list is going to make me throw up. This is going to make me fucking throw up. It's David Johnson, the Houston Texans, man. I'm telling you, like this, this is what this list was. Leonard Fournette, David Johnson. James Conner. It's all dudes that I just like. I Last year were washed because you had to take them in the fourth round. Just such bad picks. But this is a theme. They were overvalued last year and now they're undervalued. All the dudes that were all the dudes that were drafting them in the third, fourth, fifth round of last year are going to have that stank on them. They're going to have that David Johnson stank on them. And now they're like, I don't want to go back to him because I saw how bad he was last year. But now we're bite just when we think we're out. Y'all know the line. Y'all know what I'm talking about right here. Should you be drafting anyone on this Houston team? Honestly, like probably not. But I imagine the team is going to be similar to remember the Bengals two years ago when uh, Andy Dalton was their starter and then he got hurt and then they were playing with backup quarterbacks and the whole second half of the year was just like feeding Joe Mixon 35 carries a game. It would be they'd be getting the point was to try to not get blown out to eat up as much clock as you possibly can so that the score is not like 41 nothing by the end of the game didn't work. They still got their asses blown out like in every game, but. That's what I imagine this will be like. They're going to try their best not to go like 0-17 or 0-17. Oh, yeah, we play 17 games now, and they're just going to feed their running backs ball after ball after carry after carry after carry. So I think David Johnson's volume is just purely going to be too high. I know they added whatever. Mark Ingram was basically dead. They have Philip Lindsay, who I think will take some some work for sure. But if you look at what David Johnson did last year, I really, I actually, 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 despite every all the shit I've talked about him, I still think he's got some left in the tank, man. You look at uh, his his participation in routes last year, number five in overall routes run, number one in route participation, 70.5% route participation, number one amongst running backs, over 11% target share, yards per reception, number one amongst all NFL running backs, yards per touch, number eight, breakaway runs, as we said before, for um, Gus Edwards, he's right behind Gus Edwards, seventh in breakaway runs, eighth in breakaway run rate. So maybe he doesn't have the long speed like he used to have. Maybe he's not as agile or elusive or whatever. But David Johnson, if you give this guy 250 to 275 touches, like he's going to turn out an RB2 season. And the fact that you have to, that you can draft him as a fucking RB4 now, I don't see any reason why you shouldn't be taking a guy like David Johnson now. And that will round out my favorite late round running back picks. Going anywhere from pick like 95 to 140. That's where David Johnson's going right now. I oh, know he's running back 42, 120 overall. So still double digit rounds. I mean, listen, 
we want to get our running backs early. We want to get them off, and then we don't. We want to not worry about them for the remainder of the draft. But I understand there are going to be enticing names available at the wide receiver position. Everybody wants a piece of AJ Brown. Everybody wants some Travis Kelsey on their roster. So there are going to be some teams that end up fading running back for a little while, and you've got to be hammering these guys. Take a couple of these guys. One of them will give you back an RB two season. I, I highly recommend you not leave one of the first two rounds with a running back so that you don't put yourself in a position where you need like two or three of these guys to actually pop off because that shit ain't going to happen. Probably one of these guys will be useful in fantasy at the end of the year because that's how this shit works, right? The later on in the draft you get, the less likely these, these guys are to hit. So give yourself the highest probability with volume. These guys were volume plays last year, but when you're drafting them in the third, fourth, fifth round, you're looking for upside. You need volume plus efficiency to hit upside. When you're drafting in the 10th round, volume will do the job. There's a trade-off. Not everything is black and white, and people need to start understanding that in fantasy. There's a spectrum for every player. We don't hate every player, just some players, but we don't hate every player until we put them on a scale, okay? There's upside, there's risk, and when you factor those correctly, the majority of your teams, your entirety of your team will be a collection of risk and upside correctly baked into a beautiful cookie and and it'll be delicious at the end and your team will be delicious and these videos will continue to be delicious if you enjoy them and you hit the thumbs up button and you subscribe to the channel because this is the shit we're going to be doing all summer five fucking days seven days a week realistically um for the next three months it is june 1st as i'm filming this so welcome to june let's absolutely smash this motherfucking summer and thank you again for joining me Subscribe to the channel again if you're new. Go check out Underdog Fantasy. I love y'all. I'm out. <laughs>